Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Coca Sexton with Inside View. Thank you for joining today's Social Selling University webinar titled Nine Killer Steps to Boost Your Sales. I want to go through a couple housekeeping items before we get started here. We have some wonderful content. Uh, we are joined today by our guest speaker, Joanne Black, who I'll be introducing shortly. But just so everybody is kind of familiar with how we run these webinars, Be sure to stop by Social Selling University, new website redesign, sign up for the news tips. Join our LinkedIn group, get involved in the discussion there. And we want to make these webinars as interactive as possible. So what we offer to everybody, oh, we, you know, we like to talk to you know, our attendees. So what we want you to do is raise your hand when uh, you have a question. You can feel free to type anything you want into the chat box. But what we'd like to see is some uh, you know, questions come from the audience. So what I'd like everybody to do who is paying attention, raise your hand using the button. And let's see uh, how, look at this. Everybody's paying attention this morning. This is amazing. Good job, everyone. All right, now I'm going to lower everybody's hands. So now you know how to uh, ask a question. If uh, you want to get on the phone, if you have a mic and speakers uh, connected to your computer or wherever you're listening to us from, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And when we have a moment, we will you know, interject. I'll uh, introduce you, and then you can ask me or the guest speaker uh, anything that you may have. So without further delay, I would like to uh, pass the ball off here to our guest speaker, Joanne Black. She is a amazing resource when it comes to how to leverage your existing network and how to build your networks to build referral business. Because uh, as we know, uh, you know, the easiest way to get in the door with a new prospect is leverage. And I think she's going to go through a lot of this content. Joanne, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Outstanding. And I'm passing, uh, passing presenter mode over to you so you can start showing your screen and telling us how to do our jobs better. <laughs> oh, nine killer steps. I love it. So as soon as you pass the baton to me, I will be able to then show everybody my screen and they're ready for the nine killer steps. Uh, so you know everybody, technology is uh, wonderful when it works and we're going to make that happen right now. There we go. So can you see my screen, Coca? We can see it. Perfect. OK. So welcome, everybody, to Nine Killer Steps to Boost Your Sales. And they are killer steps. This time together is time for us to step back and really take a look at our business that we don't always take the time to do. So as Coca said, I'm Joanne Black. I like to pretend we're in the same room, so we're in a virtual room, so that I can really see you and you can see me. And I'm San Francisco Bay Area. Beautiful, beautiful day here. And as Coca mentioned, that I talk about referral selling a lot. In fact, I wrote the book on that topic to teach people and have them learn and practice and have a referral discipline so they can get new clients faster. And this is an amazing book, Joanne. And anybody who's on this phone right now uh, attending this webinar or watching this recording, if uh, you haven't had a chance to read this book, I mean, this book goes through fundamentals as well as advanced things that you really should know as a salesperson that's trying to build your craft and become a professional. This is, this is the textbook on how to do this. Thank you. And you know what? It's now it's available on Kindle and Nook. And if you don't have a reader, you can still get it and read it on your PC, which is very cool. And by the end of the summer, uh, this book will be in audio as well. I recorded it. So lots of ways we can get content. I don't think I told you that. <laughs> I'm always up to new things. I can listen to no more cold calling on my drive to work now. Yeah, you know, I do as well. I'm saying, hey, that was a good point, Joanne. I think I better do it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't listen to your own, po your own book as you're driving into work, do you, Joanne? Once in a while I do. You know, because I, we all forget, don't we? This we is get true. our routine, and we just keep doing the same things over and over again. And so in listening to the book, what made me realize it's timeless. This book is timeless. and the It is timeless. As well. Yeah. So um, let's, let's take a look at what we promised people today. Pretty aggressive agenda. 
we said that um, you will discover three ways to prove you're the expert. And we'll also talk about why that's important. Then to get rid of sacred cows. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And the whole purpose in that is that you move your business in a direction that's going to bring results to you and just grab a ton more time in your week. And then prioritize those high payoff activities and ditch the rest. And this is tough to do. You know, we all have so many things going on in a day. And how, in fact, can we determine what we're going to work on and what we're just going to say not doing that? And then how, in fact, can we make the ROI case and seal the deal? So why will companies buy from us? And how do we change how we talk about what we do to make that happen? But that's what we promised, Coca, and we're going to get there very quickly. But I think we need to focus first on the people who are here today. So I'd like to find out a little bit from all of you about your biggest overall business challenge. And I've outlined some here. And let me just go through them briefly. And then if there's other box. But is it, there's so many priorities. And they're shifting all the time, whether we work for ourselves or we work for a company. So how am I going to figure out what to do? Is that, a, is that a really big issue for you? Is it getting to the decision maker? You know, I've got all these gatekeepers I can't get through. Is that a real challenge? Is it, what is a process for how my team and I communicate with our customers? What's the loop? Is it working? Is it broken? Or is there just none? Is it, you know, I really need to get both revenue and profits up. That's huge for me. Or is it, you know, there's so many competitors in the marketplace. They're getting in. They're undercutting me on price. Um, it's just I'm losing deal after deal. And so, Coca, if you could launch the poll, we're going to ask all of you to vote on what are your biggest business challenges. All right, everyone, you should see the poll up on your screen. Uh, feel free to uh, choose your answer or type it in to the chat box if it's not in here. But I uh, would expect that most of us run into one of these, one of these five uh, as a sales challenge. Well, the initial results are pretty impressive. Everybody's just about done. This may be the first poll we have 100% of the people attending actually voting. <laughs> well, this is hot. This is a hot topic. It really is hot. So we've right, got, there's there's yeah. still a couple more coming in. Oh, boy. So now we're up at 105%. That's pretty good. All right. I'll close it off just around 98% here. So I'm showing the results. Um, you know, Joanne can't see them, but you know what the results are. I mean, they're pretty impressive. Um, you know, 41% of the people attending say that their biggest sales challenge is getting to the decision maker, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you hear a lot, Joanne. Yeah, um, sure. Number two is juggling priorities, shifting focus. That's 23%. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third uh, biggest sales challenge that our attendees are experiencing is, is finding a way to, uh, of increasing both revenue and profits. Okay. So, um, and, and they all link, and, and we'll be going through, and, and I want to give everybody specific tips that you can use immediately um, to address these challenges. And what was the percent on revenue and profit? Did you have that? 16% uh, on that one. Okay. All right. It's very interesting that price isn't an issue. It's <laughs> I think you've been reading some of my colleagues' things about how we don't compete on price. Yeah. Yes. We are going to address these and give you some specific tips. I want to start with someone who I consider a sage that I think will frame our conversation. He's Ram Sharan, and Ram is an, a business advisor, a professional speaker, and you'll see the date on this, February 12, 2008. Well, why do I put this slide up? That sounds like really old news. That's four years ago. But in February 2008, if we look back to them, the recession in the United States was just starting, but nobody recognized it yet. In fact, 
it wasn't until December of 2008 that the Department of Economic Research said that the recession in the United States began in December of 2007. I thought that was really nice of them to tell us that a year later. At any rate, in February, <laughs> in February, Ram Charan published this article. And I keep this and look at it all the time because what he said in 2008 still applies, that if we want to grow our business, we need to keep building. We need to get those communication lines intense with our customers, with our internal teams. We have to continue to evaluate who our customers are. We can't just cut back and not think about what we're doing. And those of us who take charge and compete will win. And the work we're going to do together now will address a lot of these. But I, I look at this all the time, Coca, and I say, you know, this is still true today. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to frame our conversation, not talking about my point of view, but someone else's. And so what we're going to do, my belief is that every one of us can land great clients, whatever the economy is, and we can all make more money in any economy. And for those of you who have been with me before, you know that I have a lot of definite points of view. And some of them are... You're not opinionated, Joanne. <laughs> not just about sales, but that's what we're <laughs> talking about. So, you know, you all know the landscape has changed. You said that. You know, your biggest priorities are getting to the decision maker and, you know, shifting focus, juggling priorities. So if you continue to follow the path everybody else is on, you're just going to go with all of them and you're not going to differentiate. So I encourage you to take a look at where you are and carve your own path. Step out and you will discover amazing things. So let's get into now the first killer step, is broaden your perspective and then narrow your focus. Well, you may say to me, Joanne, I don't get it. How can I do both? I can't, you know, look broadly and then narrow. Well, yes, you can. Think about when you look through a, a, a camera. Well, this is an SLR camera, so you will get you know, a lens that moves, and but even on our great digital cameras today, we have zoom lenses. And think about when you look through a camera, you get the big picture first, the wide picture. Say you're looking at a landscape. You'll see the trees, the mountains, the grass. Maybe you'll see an animal grazing. Big picture. And then you're going to take your zoom, and you're going to focus in on what's important to you. What is it that you want to snap and grasp? I'd like us all to think about our businesses that way. What is it we can snap and grasp? What are the opportunities that we haven't looked at before? You know, thinking about our business very, very differently than we have before. One of the, the, the things I love is when I fly Southwest Airlines, because they make my experience so much fun. But they thought about their business differently. What they've said, they're in the entertainment business. They just happen to fly planes. That's really thinking about their business differently. And all of us need to step back and do that, whether we work for ourselves, whether we are a CEO, whether we run a sales team, whether an individual contributor. One of the ways to do that is to take a look at building new alliances. One of the things that I believe has come out of the recession we're emerging from now is that people are talking to people in different ways. They're looking at creative ways to build their businesses, alternate distribution channels. So software companies, many have had a reseller or a channel of our environment. Many haven't. And those who have ha haven't are starting their own because they realize they can't do everything on their own. So they're looking at new distribution channels. And in fact, today, I, I get daily emails from the San Francisco Business Times and the Silicon Valley Business, Business Journal. And it's all that's going on. And, and the headlines today were perfect to talk about building new alliances, doing business differently, thinking about how we can expand our business, 
through others. And when we're looking at a big challenge is increasing revenue and profits, we need to look beyond what we can do for ourselves and for our company. So the first that comes through, is, the first headline was, Apple turns to TomTom for maps. Well, we all know Apple and Google really don't like each other very much. And so the subhead is, a day after Apple officially declared the end of its long use of Google Maps as the default directions app on its mobile devices, a deal with a former rival was announced. So TomTom is actually a Dutch company. And they will uh, have the new mobile mapping feature on Apple. Another head, the subhead is Verizon Wireless is trying a new strategy at the end of the month as it tries to find easy to replace unlimited data plans on mobile devices. Trying something new, reaching out. Facebook turns to Comscore to show its ads work, subhead. Facebook is using a study it commissioned by Comscore to show, contrary to what General Motors says, ads on its social network really do work. And on and on we go. That name companies every day you can see are building new alliances. So what can you do in your business? One of my clients totally revamped his sales strategy. They were reacting to every RFP and piece of business that came in. They were not making money. So when you talk about a dive in profitability, theirs just went <laughs> down the rat hole. What they did is they partnered with another company that had complementary products. And because of that, in effect, they doubled their sales footprint. They built a new alliance. So another thing that's important to do is to continue to learn and grow. You know, there's mastermind groups out there, advisory groups, ways you can share information, accountability partners. You know, accountability for sales is huge. It is tremendous. When we are accountable, we get things done because someone's holding our feet to the fire. Whether it's a sales executive or whether it's someone we know any place in the world that we can meet with once a week, every two weeks, on the phone, through Skype, in person, doesn't matter, and hold each other accountable and, and coach as well. One of the things is advisory groups. I heard a, a futurist speak a couple years ago, and she said, assemble an advisory group, people you don't know who don't know your business. She says, even people who don't think the way you do. Oh, that scared the heck out of me. But I thought, you know, that's a good idea. And even invite teenagers. You know, they have a point of view about everything. Why not? Give them food. Everybody's got to eat. And tell them where you're taking your business. Get their input. People who don't know what you do. You'll get creative ideas. It doesn't mean that you have to accept everyone. But I know that you'll come away with ideas that you didn't think of. Now, in the, in the spirit of learning and growing, CSO Insights, if you don't know about that, you need to go to their website, csoinsights.com, does surveys on and on. And in 2011, they did a skills reinforcement survey. And they asked sales executives, if you could, which of these selling skills would you reinforce? And I thought, well, this is really interesting. The first was identifying strategic needs over 60%, account strategy and planning, over 56%, listening skills, 50%, prospecting, 48%, probing needs analysis, almost 51%. And they all said that the reason these were important because they could quantify the benefits with a higher win percentage, more accounts in the pipeline, shorter selling cycles, and better customer retention. So what do these things say to me when I read them? They're all strategic. They're an opportunity to step back. And what this CSO Insight study is saying to me is we're not taking the time to do this. We're just, just diving right ahead rather than being strategic and doing some analysis and figuring out where we want to go. So that's the first killer step. Take a broad perspective. Narrow your focus. 
that's going to be tremendous for you. So hey, Joy, quick question about that. Yes. You know, so as you know, a salesperson, you know, a lot of people who attend these webinars, um, you know, are individual reps all the way up to directors. I mean, we have executives that attend these, but yes. you know, how, how do you, would you create one of these groups? What's the easiest way to go about that? Do you start internally with uh, your own teams, or do you kind of branch out? No, I think you definitely branch out. I think there's best. I know there's best practices in every company because every sales um, organization I work with has people who are doing a terrific job. So we can always map best practices. My belief is we need to go outside of our organization because we all become so insular, don't we? And we need to talk to people who don't know our business. That's kind of the first advisory group. And then we can join business groups or mastermind groups. There's a ton of them out there. And if they're not there, we can start our own. Well, you bring in people at your level from different kinds of businesses. And you, you, you talk about ideas for growing your business. You talk about what worked for you, what didn't. You get coaching from people. There's tons of groups out there like that. And if they're not there, start it. Even with the accountability partner, when I work with sales teams, that's one of the things I ask everybody to do. And I always get questions because I say it has to be someone outside of your organization. And I get pushback about that sometimes. Why can't I just like work with someone here you know, who sits next to me or you know, who's across the country or in another part of the world? And I said, no, because they're going to agree. We need those different points of view, and we need to hear them. And we don't hear them enough. True, very true. That help? Absolutely. OK. So um, let me go the wrong way here. So the next killer step is to stay connected. There's lots of ways to connect today. I say network like crazy. <laughs> we need to be out there all the time. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Woody Allen, who said that 80% of success is showing up. Now we show up in person, we show up online, we show up a lot of different ways. But showing up counts. And for all my clients, I say at least one networking event a week. You need to show up. There's nothing that beats in person. One of my clients is a senior vice president of worldwide sales. And when I interviewed him, he said that he visits his customers in person. And he learns why they chose his company. I said, his name's George. I, mean, I call everybody George, but this really is George. And he said, you know, Joanne, I visit because my people, my salespeople hear what they want to hear and what they want to see. He gets a different perspective. So he shows up with his customers. And we need to be there all the time. Because people don't want to hear from us just when we need something. No, and we know who those people are. I know, I get calls, and you know the minute you see that number come up on the phone, you say, oh, what do they need now? It's about staying in touch. So I, have a, I worked with Community Bank, and the president says he stays in touch with his peers, competitors. I said, why do you do that? He says, well, sometimes we can't bank them. And another community bank also may decide they want to sell. We might want to buy them. So he stays in touch. So we need to go where our customers go, find out what associations they belong to, and show up all the time. That's what's important, showing up one networking event a week. Because really, connections count. And we, you know, we can talk on the phone. That's like a second best way of making connections. And then we can build our social media connections as another way to expand our network. But the whole idea, whatever our connections, is say, Coca, this is you. So I want to find out who you know, who are your connections here, who are there. Now, the thing is, LinkedIn and other social media can give us a lot of information. I can find out a lot out about you, Coca. But what I can not find out about you, unless I speak to you, is Who's your next door neighbor? I don't know who your brother-in-law is. I don't know who's in your running club or what sports you, you're, you're interested in. There's a lot I don't know about you by looking you up. 
But, There's a lot of stuff about me you don't you don't want to know. Yeah, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, the the thing is, it's all about expanding, and it's expanding when we're in person. It's expanding when we're talking on the phone, and it's expanding within social media. That's what we need to continue to be doing. And I want to give you now my point of view about the social media. Hey, so one first, second, Joanne. Yes. Um, we have a we have a question. Somebody raises their hand. I always appreciate these. Yes. Um, Dick, are you there? I hear him in the background. He would be multitasking, would he? Because he's juggling his priorities. That's what's going he on. He's juggling his priorities. All right. Well, I guess we're going to have to hang up on Mr. Rand. Okay. Raise your hand again if, uh, if if you come on. All right. So you'll let me know if we have another question. I will. Okay. So uh, what we're going to talk about is a little bit about social media. There's people who take a deep dive into LinkedIn. I know Barb Giamanco is one of your experts, and you've done webinars with her. And you, and you also have a webinar uh, tomorrow, I think, Coca, don't you, on the ROI about social media? Yes, tomorrow uh, Inside View has a webinar titled "The ROI of Social Selling." Uh, we have, uh, you know, one of my favorites, uh, Craig Rosenberg, aka the Funnel Holic, um, attending it with us, and we're going to go through uh, some real-world examples on uh, leveraging social media and what you know we we coined as social selling, uh, and where the ROI is in that for individual reps as well as you know executives. You know, that's really what executives want to see is you know, where's the return on letting my sales team get on Twitter during the day. Uh, and we have some real world examples, so it's a webinar that we're going to have tomorrow. Perfect, and I've already registered. So there you go, and it's recorded, everybody. All right, so discipline process. So what we need to do as individuals or the, whether we work for an organization is what's our social strategy? Who's going to drive it? So we need really an ambassador to set the, set the strategy and drive the process. We need to set goals around it, establish metrics, and I know you'll be talking about that. We need to stay active, so showing up once a month or once a week doesn't count, and definitely to be current. We don't want old news, we want good information. So let me give you my point of view around LinkedIn, which as Coca, you said a long time ago, is Facebook with a tie. I love that, <laughs> that it is a professional site. Uh, so it's a great place to find out who people are, who they know, how you're connected, and also for search engine optimization. And in the last webinar we did, we, we talked about this a little bit. Once you know this, then you need to pick up the phone and talk to people because a lot of people uh, accept every LinkedIn invitation. They may not know it. And when you ask people to introduce you, you need to have that conversation first. So please have the conversation. But always remember that these are really important things about LinkedIn, and it doesn't take a lot of time. Complete your profile. LinkedIn will show you what you need to do. Please include a professional photo, not one of those little gray things that's on there. People do business with people. I want to see you, and I don't want to see you on the beach with a margarita in your hand. Customize your LinkedIn invitation. So I'd say 90% of the invitations I get are, I'd like you to join my professional network on LinkedIn. Um, you know what? That's so impersonal because what social media is about is about in connection, building relationships with people. And you don't do that with that standard invitation. And also, please don't tell me um, I'm your friend because I'm not. I don't know who these people are. So I always customize my invitation, and if you'd like to invite me, those of you on, on the webinar today, say, hey, it was great listening to you on, on the Inside View webinar. Please join me at LinkedIn. At least I know how you got to me. Short. Yeah, nothing, nothing's worse than just getting that generic thing. In fact, I delete those when I get them now um, because I, I've just come, become you know, accustomed to have, customizing them myself, so other people should be doing it also. It's just it's a, a personal touch. Uh, one thing I don't like is that the mobile app for LinkedIn, I'm on that from time to time, and you can't customize those messages, so I end up just doing all my invitations or connection requests uh, from a PC. Well, that's it, and, and it's getting back to what is the purpose of social, social media. It's really to make connections, to get to know people, 
to share good content, your points of view. It's about a relationship. So you're inviting people. You wouldn't be hosting a party and say, you know, come to my party and not give, you know, hey, you usually say, hey, I'd really like you would attend. It's a special event. You know, you're giving color to it. Um, you're, you're building connections. I'd say treat people like you're having a party. You're hosting them. You're building a connection. You're, you're starting a relationship. So always customize and also reply to every invitation with, with some kind of a custom reply. And I do this always. In fact, the other day I got a, an email, actually a LinkedIn response to my response from someone who said he was new to a company and he never saw a LinkedIn response like that and, and he went on for like a paragraph about what he was doing. And so I said, okay, you know, people do appreciate that. Uh, and so that's what I'd like you to do. And please post interesting content and it's not a place to sell. But that's the purpose of social media is to begin to build those connections and then after that, you have that personal conversation. So I have a bit of social proof about that, Coca. And you may know who this is. Um, it's kind of hard to tell with his cap and uh, gown on, but this is Eric Schmidt, now the executive chairman of Google. And there's two talks that he did that that just were so powerful to me. In May of 2009, he spoke to the graduating class of the University of Pennsylvania. And here's what he said, and I quote, turn off your computer. You're actually going to have to turn off your phone and discover all that's human around us. He continued, nothing beats holding the hand of your grandchild as he walked his first steps. So here you have the executive chairman of Google telling us that turn off our computers. And then this year, 2012, at Boston University commencement address again, he said, take one hour a day and turn that thing off. Take your eyes off that screen and look into the eyes of the person you love. Have a conversation, a real conversation. Point made. Web tools do not replace a personal conversation. We need to connect without clicking. And in fact, Sherry Turkle, who's a professor at MIT, had an article in the New York Times that was about the flight from conversation, how we hide behind technology, and we're not talking to people. And she also wrote a book, which I've begun, because I was so fascinated, called Alone Together, subtitle why we expect more from technology and less from each other. She's a psychologist and a researcher. So fascinating. So what I say is, pick up the darn phone. Put whatever expletive you want in there, but nothing replaces a personal conversation. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone on March 7, 1876. Well, that's when he got the patent. That's 136 years ago. For the most part, the phone doesn't crash. We all know how to use it. It's really simple. So pick up the darn phone and talk to people. That's how to stay connected. OK, <laughs> now on to the next. Be nimble and innovative. What's the next great thing? And where's your next bright idea? You know, we're never going to have all the facts. We need to make quick decisions. In fact, in the June 11, uh, 2012, yesterday's issue of Fortune magazine, the founders of Levenger, which some of you may know of, it's a catalog on lamps and reading materials and uh, just really cool leather goods. Um, Lori and Steve started this company. And they gave advice in the sidebar of this article on a Fortune. And they said, just start. You can study something to death. Get started. Learn from your customers. At some point, if your gut says you're ready, you've got to take the leap. You've got to. Can't wait. So where is your next bright idea? We need to get rid of the sacred cows. And I said, this is one of the things you were going to take away. A sacred cow is something we hold on to because we 
done it. It's what we're known for. It's our brand, and we tend to just hold on, hold on, hold on, even when it's not working anymore. So an example is Procter & Gamble in the late 1990s. Two brands they were known for, Comet and Crisco, weren't making money, wasn't working. They sold them off and use that money to invest in other profitable things. It's an old story which I talked in book about uh, a young girl who watched her mother cook and as she had a ham and she always cut off the ends of the ham, one end and then the And the little girl said to her mother, why do you cut off the ends of the ham before you put it in the pan? And the mother said, I don't know, I've always done it that way. Call your grandmother. So the little girl called her grandmother and said, Grandma, why do you cut off the ends of the ham before you put it in the pan? And the grandmother said, that's easy. Didn't fit in the pan. So what are we doing that we keep doing, and we don't know why we're doing it, but we just keep doing it, and it's not getting results anymore. And you can look at traditional publishing, gone. You know, and we're still tied to so many of the things we're always doing. Um, Tim Cook at Apple. Again, on the, on the cover of Fortune magazine in, in this June 11th issue, he's putting his own stamp on an apple. Some of it's going to be controversial. And he doesn't apologize for setting a new course. But he is honoring Steve Jobs' dying request. Do not ask, what would Steve do? And instead ask, do what's best for Apple. And that's what he's doing. He's doing what's best for Apple. And I'll quote Eric Schmidt again. In the same, uh, in 2009 University of Pennsylvania commencement address, he urged graduates not to lay a rigid path for themselves. He said rewards will gravitate to those who make mistakes and learn from them. And then he added, you can't plan innovation and inspiration, but you can be ready for it. And when you see it, you can jump on it and you can make a difference. Now my last example is I want you to come back with me to the summer of 1787. We're in Philadelphia. It's hot, burning hot. It's humid. There's no air conditioning. We're in small rooms with closed windows. We have heavy wool clothing. We are the founding fathers of the United States of America. We wrote the Constitution in just a few weeks. Did we have all the facts? No, we didn't, but we did it. That was 225 years ago. So if they did it, we can do the same thing. And I'll just remind you that we always tend to underestimate the journey and overestimate the destination. So we get this bright idea and we say, oh, it's, yeah, it's going to happen in you know three months. <laughs> Well, it doesn't. So whatever time you think it's going to take double it, but at least start and know that it's going to take longer than you think and maybe it's, you know, it's not going to have the exact impact, but we need to be flexible and just jump on that innovation. So that's the uh, number three killer step. Now number four, powerful one, which is dazzle your current customers. How are you going to get them to say, wow, I really want to work with you? We need to talk to them. Our current customers are our best source of new business. Talk to them. Find out how we can help them. Visit them like George did. We need to stay in touch because they're our best source of new business. We haven't thought about that. We can expand business within their organization, and then, of course, we can always find out who they know that they can uh, introduce us to. Very, very best source of new business. And I'd ask you, even though you said that the process for communicating with your customers and your team wasn't a big issue for you, in a lot of the work I've done with clients, whether it's in whatever business, it could be in um, software firms who you know, I'm a salesperson, I sell the software, and then my implementation team comes in. What's the loop? How, as a salesperson, do I stay in touch? My implementation team, you know, they might find business, but that's not really their role. What's the role of customer service? What's the role of everybody in the organization? Um, 
CPA firm, you know, people will know us. We do tax and we do audit, but you know, we also have insurance, we have financial planning, and we have a technology group. There's an old saying in sales that people know the part of the elephant they touch. <laughs> so they may not know everything you do. We need to help them help us. They are our best source of new business. How are you going to uh, stay in touch? I worked with a client yesterday, and in July, they have a Customer Appreciation Month, and they're actually writing up a short, very short um, story about some of their great customers, and they're showcasing them on their website, in their community groups, and then they're also talking about actually printing that out, having it framed, and sending to them. So how are you acknowledging and showcasing your customers, your clients? They are our best source of new business. Make them say, wow. Dazzle them. Number five is prioritize wisely. So juggling priorities, shifting focus. So here you see, if you look at this picture of somebody buried in paperwork, whether it's paperwork, whether it's files on our computer, we are all overwhelmed with work to do. You'll notice the word of the priority is singular. We can only do one thing. Multitasking doesn't work. There's been a lot of research about it that we're way less effective. We multitask that we really don't get things done. I used to like the old days when I had to bring all my emails in, so I had to stop what I was doing and bring them in. We're so tempted. I know that you're there now. You're looking at your emails, and you're, you're also trying to pay attention to what we're talking about. That's what we do. But when we're not fully engaged, we're not looking someone in the eye, so to speak, we lose so much of what we could gain. So what's the first priority? I'm going to help you with that. I do what's closest to cash every single day. What that means is that what is going to move my business forward? And we all got stuck in the email jungle, right? I say to clients, what do you do first thing in the morning? Well, I check email. Well, when do you surface? Some of them tell me lunch. Well, ha, ha, ha. You know, I mean, sometimes that's true. But it always is this time suck. I'm always checking email, and people expect immediate response. And if you don't respond immediately, I mean, it's this whole like wheel. We just keep going round and round and round. And I said, let's stop. Stop. The prioritize is about focus. We talked about that in the first killer step, that we're going to take a moment to focus our business, know who we're looking for, and if requests come in and things that don't move our business forward, we need to say no or refer them to another source. That's a tremendously freeing activity, by the way. Things that are closest to cash could mean, oh, I need to follow up with that person. We all have CRMs that are going to give us a task list. We can do that so easily. It may mean I need to write a proposal. Not a favorite thing to do, but you know we need to do it. I need to follow up on the proposal. Oh, somebody's going to be back from vacation. I need to schedule that personal meeting. And then also what's closest to cash is we need to be prospecting. We need to be thinking who, when I'm using the, the example from the slide before, if I'm looking at COCA, who are his connections? He's offered to connect me. You know, who do I want him and I'm going to ask him to introduce me to? And I need to do a little research around that first. Because if we're not prospecting when we're busy, we have no pipeline. So that's an important closest to cash activity. <laughs> what happens is when you clearly prioritize closest to cash, and then you look at your emails at the end of the day, you're going to see that some of them really don't need any action. They're not important because they're not driving your business. And this was difficult for me to do because I was always wanting to answer every email right away that day. I'm not going to leave anybody behind. But there's articles I need to read, things I you know need to do, and I look at it later and I say, you know what, this isn't important anymore. If it's not moving your business forward, it's not important. It's OK to say no. If nobody else will give you permission, I will give you permission to do that. So prioritize those high payoff activities, and don't be afraid to call it quits. If something isn't working, stop. 
there's no reason you have to continue. Even if your boss says, you, says to you, you need to. Challenge it. Why do you keep, why do you do something that is not getting results? Does that make sense, Coca? I think so. That we always... Yeah, you're preaching to the choir. This all makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> all right. So the next thing is, is to be the expert. And this is going to help you. One of the things that's going to help you get to the decision maker is being the expert. Uh, and truly, this is counterintuitive. And this is why. So, so we need to sharpen our expertise. We need to display that to our prospects and clients because companies hire the expert. In, when people spend money and they're starting to do that now, they're going to hire the person that they know will do the job. And when you position yourself as an expert, so it could be that you're an expert in a specific product or a specific market niche. So maybe your focus is only on community banks. Maybe your focus is only on software companies with a channel. Those, by the way, are two of my areas of focus. Maybe your focus is you work only with global organizations that have X, Y, and Z issues. But what is the niche? Because that's where you are known as the expert. I am known as the expert on referral selling. Now, that applies across industry, but that's my niche right there, that piece. For others, it can be a certain person. Uh, engineers. So there's someone I know who works with engineers because they know how they think and one refers them to the next. I know a financial planner who has only worked with teachers for the past 20 years, actually more than that, but for the past years he's made President's Club every single year. And we ask him, where are you going this year? Because they know him. He's positioned the expert. They know how I think. They know what I do. So we think that if we don't mention everything we do when we leave something out, they, you know, that, that we'll get the business. The opposite is true. Be the expert. That will also help you get to the decision maker because nobody today, who's, whoever's your buyer, I'm putting that in quotes, they don't want to make any mistakes. They don't want to lose their job. So how do they ensure that? They ensure that because they hire the expert. That's you. So don't be afraid then. Picture again, you're looking through the wide lens of the camera. You're narrowing your focus. Narrowing it, what, it, what not only are you good at, what does your company do well? What do you really do well? And you hear stories of companies saying, I'm, go, I'm going, we tried this, we tried that, we're going back to our core business. We hear that all the time. Why? That's what they're known for. That's what they do well. That's why clients buy. So don't be afraid to narrow your focus. The seventh killer step is one of my favorites. Don't cut price. I heard a marketing expert talk years ago. She said 95% of companies offer to cut price before they're even asked. I actually had this, this happen. I bought a new service last week, and the person I worked with, I knew I'd met him a couple times. He immediately said, you know, Joanne, because you're you, because we know each other, I'm giving you this special price. Well, did I really believe that? No. So why do we run this game? You know, we, we do it all the time. How much are you going to give me? I just won't play that game. It's about getting in and getting started. So if you need to trim and have a smaller project to get in and make a name for yourself, do that. We, we actually did this with a client. It was I partnered with an organization, and we developed some uh, webinar training for a client. And they kept pushing back and pushing back and pushing back on price. But we knew what their goal was. And, you know, they said, well, you know, we don't pay that for what we've done before. And what I did is I went back to the partner I was working with, and I said, are you willing to walk away? And he said, absolutely. So I went back to the client and I said, you know, given what your goals are, that we can't trim any more to get you to your goals. 
So maybe you should just wait till you have this in your budget. It was very interesting because you found the money. But you need to be willing to walk away as well. But get in and get started. If you do need to make any modifications, and I'm not talking about price, so maybe you add a, an extra service, something that's cost you something. Maybe you send them a book or some articles. I, mean, I don't know what you do, but get something in return. So for me, is I mean, I always ask for a referral, but you can write that in your agreement that they will refer you based on the results you deliver. So as I said, trim fat, not muscle. If there's anything extra, but then be willing to walk away and give them options. Give them lots of options. You know, if you get, if you choose this package, here's what you get. This get in this package, here's what you get. Let them pick, but don't cave on price. And I wouldn't. Even, I don't make that an option because I don't. This made it a choice. I price fairly, and it, when you when you actually deliver value and the, your prospect gets your value, they're not going to be questioning you on your price. So always circle back. All right. Now, eight killer step is talk return on investment. And here's my point of view. And I think you've heard this before. It is not about us. Customers don't care about us. You know, it's not about the features and function. It's not about how cool our software is. It seems so obvious, but we're not doing it. And we're not doing it because we really haven't learned how to do it. Um, so when um, I work with clients and we talk about what are the results you deliver, what's the business impact? Also, the question I ask is, why should I work with you? And every one of us should be asking ourselves that question. It's based on results. I'm going to refer you not just because you're a nice guy, but because I know you can help someone because you've told me about the results you deliver. Now, when I ask salespeople about, tell me about, you know, your results, the business impact, it's like it doesn't, it doesn't calibrate. And, and I actually blogged about this recently. I called it ditch the personal pronoun because what we hear are things like this. We're experienced. We're professional. We've been in business for 25 years. We have long support hours. We're local to you. Oh, and by the way, the litmus test for this, if you can say, so what? It's not a result. So listen to the rest of these. We have multiple industry awards. We understand your business issues. We do everything we can to help you succeed. We provide solutions that help your company grow and prosper. We do business with integrity and commitment. We volunteer in the community. We take the time to listen to your goals. We are your one-stop shop. I can say, so what, to every one of those, and they all begin with we. Doesn't tell me one thing about why I should do business with you. It's really, so what? But that's, see, that's how we're used to talking. And there's a difference between what's on our web page, what I call corporate speak, and what we talk about. How do we talk about results? You need to quantify it as much as possible. So you save, typically save people, you know, 15% of their cost of goods. You, sit, you reduce their um, accounts receivable from 28 days to three. I mean, you go on and on. And any time you can show movement of from two, so from 28 days to three days, from uh, reducing their um, cycle time, from two weeks to 24 hours, whatever it is, quantify. And you can say, typically, our customers get. So you don't have any we or I statements. So we need to ditch that personal pronoun and talk results and return on investment. And this is difficult. This is probably the most difficult building block in our referral selling program because it's not the way we say, and it is a building block because I'm not going to refer you until you can answer this question for me. So it's really important. What 
is my return on investment. So that's number eight. And number nine, I think you can guess what this is. <laughs> oh, yes, number nine is build a referral business because referrals rock. And let's talk a little bit about why. You know, we, everybody tells me this. This is something I've heard over the years. We're pre-sold. So they know us. And a referral, by the way, means you have an introduction. So when you're talking about getting to the decision maker, all the research shows that the number one reason an executive will meet with a salesperson is because they've been referred, number one, from inside their company, and number two, from a trusted source outside their company. There's nothing I make up. This is research that's been done. But I've been working this referral process with clients for more than 15 years. This is what people tell me. They know about us. They want to meet with us. How cool is that? We have credibility. They trust us. Our sales time shortens. Now, nobody's going to sit back in a chair and wait for business. That would be nice. Hasn't happened yet. But your sales time can shorten by at least 20%. So when we look at saving time because we're ditching our sacred cows and we're focusing on building our business in a certain direction, we combine that with shortening our sales time when we build a referral business. This is huge. The other thing that happens is the competition diminishes. Well, it either diminishes or it goes completely away. But when it diminishes, we have the opportunity to set the criteria by which others are evaluated. And the best thing is, the time with our clients increases. It is the best business. And I'd like to ask you now, I think, Coco, we have one more poll, is that when you get that referral introduction to your decision maker, I'd like you to all reflect on your history. When you got a referral, when someone actually introduced you to the person you wanted to meet, to the decision maker, and they took the meeting, what percent of the time did that person become a client? Was it somewhere between 30 and 50%, 50 and 70, 70 to 90, 90 to 100, when you got that introduction. So, Coca, if you could launch our last poll, that would be great. All right, everyone. It's poll taking time again. Uh, take a moment just to answer these questions here. We'll give a, couple, a minute here while uh, it ends. Looks you know, like one of, one most of, the, of everyone is still paying attention. Looks yes, yeah, good. So one of the things the about, results are looking good about referrals and you know having it be uh, getting to the decision maker is the prime business challenge that people said is that referrals need to become a discipline. You know everybody agrees they're great, everybody, but for most people it's not a discipline. It's not the way they work every single day. So this is the first step, and we're going to share with. Uh, how are we doing on the poll? All right, we just closed it out. Um, the results are, yeah, the number one response uh, it's, is 70% uh, of the time. 33% uh, of the people uh, responded said that. Whoa. Okay. So you all said that your biggest challenge was getting to the decision maker. This is how you get to the decision maker. You get a referral introduction. It is that simple. <laughs> it is that simple. It okay. is. <laughs> if you could close the poll now, Coca, and then I'll go to our last couple slides because we're almost at the top of the hour. I can't believe this has gone by so quickly. Uh, so you've made your case. Referrals are how you get to the decision maker. You also get to the decision maker because you have a compelling ROI statement and because you're focused. So there's no hard cost to referrals. Everybody loves this. It's like having your own private sales force out there introducing you to people. It's the best part. It's only your time and referrals budget. So as a recap, your nine killer steps, we said you were going to be broadening your perspective, narrowing your focus. You're going to stay connected. You're going to be nimble and innovative. You're going to get your next great idea. You're going to continually dazzle your current customers. You're going to prioritize, not get sucked in the email uh, trap and do what's closest to cash first. You're going to clearly define what you do so you are the expert. You're not going to cut price. You're going to talk ROI, and you're going to build your referral business. So that's a summary of those killer steps. And 
what I'd like to share with you, I know that Inside View will be sending a follow-up email to you. And then in that email, you will receive my referral IQ quiz. <laughs> this is simple. It's a 13 yes or no question interactive PDF. It should probably take you like two or three minutes to fill out. And what it is, it becomes your checklist for building a referral business. And I also have, in addition to that, a referral benchmark checklist. If you'd like that, you can send an email to joanne at nomorecoldcalling.com, and I'd be glad to send that over to you. So you can go at any time to nomorecoldcalling.com. There's lots of information there. That my blog, my Back in the Black newsletters, where you will get referral tips every day. So here's the information, and I know, Coca, you want to wrap up for this great audience we had today. Yeah, again, it was a amazing attendance. Um, you know, it's always great when, you know, we email out a list or communicate to a, a community, and, uh, you know, over half of them actually come back, you know, a very large percentage come back to these, these webinars from Social Selling University time and time again. So, you know, I appreciate uh, all the engagement that we get with the, with, with our community, and uh, if there's other things that you, know, you want to hear about, if there's follow-up questions, as uh, Joanne mentioned, you can reach out to any of us. Um, but if there's other topics that you're interested in and you want uh, us to kind of build content around that, feel free to let us know. Uh, we're here to help you uh, become better salespeople. Uh, if uh, there's no other questions, um, most of the stuff that was coming through in the in the Q&A piece was in regards to, uh, you know, this is great content. Uh, it, everybody seemed to be very impressed with it, um, and they want the slides, uh, what we'll do is we'll make a recording of this webinar available to everyone. So Joanne, thank you so much. I think that these nine steps uh, will resonate very well. I know they did with me. And you know, if uh, there's anything else you want to say in closing? Uh, take action. Uh, so everybody said that um, getting to the decision maker, juggling priorities were really the, the two top areas of focus. What is one thing you're going to take away and do today? Because unless we do it right away, it's not going to happen. That was the goal. And for everybody to do that to address their biggest challenge, that would be the best thing you can do, whatever you've chosen. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's uh, Social Selling University webinar. And we look forward to having you on again. Bye now. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.